YouTube. Okay, it looks like we're now streaming live on YouTube. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Dive Into World Building. We, we persist. We persist. And I have a very enigmatic topic for us to discuss today. I had no idea how enigmatic it was because in my brain, it made perfect sense <laughs> to say that we're going to talk about the shape of things, <laughs> right? But, but really, what I was going to sort of get around to was kind of like, there is a logic to why things have the shape that they do. Like, for example, why is paper the shape that it is? Well, it's that shape because when you made parchment, you made it out of the skin of a sheep that had a particular shape, right? And then you folded it into these various sizes. So the fact that the paper is rectangular comes from the fact that <laughs> sheep skins are rectangular. But and sheep are not rectangular any more than cows are hmm, spherical. Yeah, but the paper, the parchment usable section of the sheep is kind of rectangular. And once you start dividing that in half and dividing it in half again, it stays rectangular. Right? You trim the bits that are really, really hard to use. Go look I mean, I, I'm just imagining I'm reams, stuff, of, huh? reams of paper shaped like, you know, flattened sheep that have been hit by a steamroller in some alternate universe. And you know, I know you're you in a different universe from all of us, but no. <laughs> um, <clears throat> we have sheep-shaped paper on Planet Cliff. Well, when the, when the sheep are spherical, get back to me. Anyway, so that's why paper is rectangular. And so, like, why are doors the shape that they are and the size that they are? Because we have these ideas of how wide a space we can go through. It's like instinctively humans, when a space becomes narrower than a certain level, we will turn to the side. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so doors are obviously going to be wider than that. <clears throat> um, my favorite moment in the movie Forbidden Planet, where they're discussing the ancient Krell who left behind no visual records whatsoever of their appearance. But Dr. Morbius says to the character played by Leslie Nielsen, the space captain, he said, well, I ask you to examine the shape of, of human doors and then examine the shape of these doors as a hint to what the Krell looked like. <laughs> and they were these large uh, pen pentagonal doors that were kind of like, ch -ch 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 -ch, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, indicating that the crawl were large and maybe kind of rounded in some, in some <laughs> fashion. But it was like, it was that hint, right? The hint of, uh, it was great world building because it was a hint of what the aliens look like and they, the costume department didn't have to come up with a crawl and the art department didn't have to come up with a picture of a crawl and the audience's imagination, um, very little was left to the audience. Even the invisible creature was eventually seen, but but that was left just in dialogue and in the set design on the doors. And, mm -hmm. and that was just a lovely bit of world building right there. Yeah. Based on doors. Based on doors. So there's doors, there are things like cups. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but I have like dis distinct opinions about the kind of cup that I want to drink from <laughs> because <laughs> the feel of drinking from it is something that I have opinions on. Um, you know, I don't like the lip of it to be too thick. But they generally shaped so that you don't spill things uh, out of square mugs mm -hmm. are difficult because you, you have to orient it, orient the mug in a particular way, or you're going to be spilling stuff all over yourself. <laughs> okay. mugs. And then there were those no spill mugs in the eighties, which had a wider bottom. Oh yeah, but that's not the yeah, but that's a matter of knocking things over. That's not a matter that's of not you're drinking out of it. Spilling while you're drinking and, from it. And, but a round, a round drinking vessel, whether it's got a lip bore or whatever, it's you tip it and it's going to funnel the fluid toward a single point, mm -hmm. hopefully your mouth. So you put the mouth on the single point, and then you're good. <laughs> yeah, generally, you have a mug, like I mean, I I well, love in theory, stuff, but 
um, you know, you get a square, a TARDIS shaped mug and yeah, you have to be very specific round cup. You can hold it with a handle, hold it without the handle, whatever. So that's unless that's you have a drinking with... problem, like an airplane splash, right? Yeah, but that's not. A... <laughs> well, yeah. but there's I mean, but there's further ways you could go with that. Like you can get away with a square mouth to a drinking vessel as long as it's small enough to fit inside your mouth. Yeah. But <laughs> if you have teeth. That's going to end up being a problem too. So, like, camels would have half the problem we would, or cows, because they don't have top teeth anyway. So that would be easier, but except that they don't drink out of vessels like that. We don't have to go there. <laughs> it's not important right now. Yeah. And you are sipping out of a straw right now, which is another way of drinking. I am indeed. Which, which would work would. better for arachnid aliens than it would for than a regular drinking vessel that humans use. Oh, like sure, pretty much. Would, almost that would be a thing you're all set. that you Anything. would do, be helpful with a TARDIS mug. If a yeah. TARDIS mug has a top and a straw, then it doesn't matter that it's square. No, like, it doesn't. Right? Like, let's talk about homes. Ah. You know, like rectilinear versus non-rectilinear homes. Well, some of that is a is a function of what we're used to. Some of that is a function of what physics we're working in. Yeah. And some of it is a function of how much space do you have to waste? So oh, I think, the materials you're building with. Yes. Materials, I mean, I tools. think once we get into space, we're going to be looking <clears throat> at, at much more sort of like hexagonal B cells that are surrounded by wiring than squares necessarily mm, because of the less wasted space well we have cylinders on the iss right Big true cylinders. and that gives us a good size jeffrey's tube at every corner yeah and the and you get an a plus there's, for the star trek reference thank you but there's there's weight there's waste space but also the more <clears throat> technology that you have that you want hidden i mean we ha we have a rectangular house you know it's thousand square feet on the, the lower floor, thousand square feet on um, the upper floor, you know, in terms of usable space. So that looks like a 2000 square foot house, but it's not 2000 square feet of living space because um, heat, heat transportation stuff, fence, whatever, takes up space that yeah. it's, you, you need it for living, but it, you can't put a table there or a chair there or whatever. Right. Um, and stairs, stairs, uh, furnace room, but all of those things, you know, the phone wires, Funny. phone wires are hidden. You want them hidden for a number of reasons. One is they're, um, not fun to, you know, they're not pretty to look at, but that's a whole nother aesthetic thing. That's yeah. a whole nother question. Mm -hmm. Um, you don't want to be tripping over them. You don't want small children and animals chewing on them. So you put them inside a wall. So that wall is also using up space right it's so if you have if, if you have space that we try to ignore hmm? it's a space we're trying to ignore right but like like bathrooms on starships but um <laughs> if you have shapes that nest together so mm -hmm. that there's no waste space then where do you put where do you put those things where do you put the broom closet I have seen apartments that have no broom closet. There's no place to put your broom unless you stick it in the corner of the bathroom or corner of, of the coat closet. Or there's no, no place where you can take your cleaning materials and separate them from your food, your linens, your coats. Mm -hmm. So those things, you know, why do people build buildings that don't take into account the need for, um, things that we don't want to look at and things that take up space while they're not being used. Brooms and phone <laughs> wires and furnaces. And when you said the things that nest together, but if you've got the, the interstices that you can't reach for mm -hmm. chairs and bookcases and people, you can stuff your wires in there. Mm -hmm. I think that actually, I mean, A, yes, those are very good points. B, a lot of what isn't get doesn't get written about is because <clears throat> in my humble opinion because the person who is writing it belongs to a category that sees those 
that does not see those things. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I was watching Edwardian Farm, and they have this whole book of the farm, and it's about how, it's how everything to do everything in Edwardian times, except for all the women's work. <laughs> wow. You know, and, I see, and I've talked to people recently about the whole, like, how many closets do you have, and what are you going to use them for? Somebody had made a beautiful reading nook in an unused closet, and I was like, what? What is this unused closet of which you speak? <laughs> I don't Pure understand. Fantasy. I know, right? Completely unbelievable fantasy, too. Come on. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of that. I mean, I, I can think of at least three people off the top of my head who don't think about um, outdoor wear, closets, for that like near the the entrance because they're not the person who goes and buys coats for their kids they're not the one who buys them boots they're not the ones who clean them up and they're not the ones who put them away you know and the same thing for like <clears throat> people who write a, who hand wave furnaces and wiring in jeffrey's tubes is because they've never had to think about that how does the hot water from the boiler get up to the fourth floor of the walk-up They've never thought about that. And so yeah. that's one of the reasons to be a generalist is that at least you do think about that. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, like if you ever played the game Mist, there's five different worlds, including Mist Island, and not one kitchen or bathroom. Yeah. Yeah, but there are like, other things you can say day. about um, Atrus that are even ruder and more on point. Uh, true. He's not an ideal parent figure. Anyway, um, <laughs> uh, but then neither was his dad, if you read the tie-in novels, which maybe some of us did. Um, well, so I'm designing <laughs> a, a residential area where all of the, all of the residential units are kind of round. <laughs> They're kind of like spheres. <laughs> mm -hmm. They're not so, spherical, but they're sort of roundish. And so I'm going, how do you put furniture in that yeah <laughs> right? that's a good question yeah. isn't it and what case. kind of furniture do you put in it that's going to be a fundamental redesign what how how do people use that curved space yeah you know so the arc i read an interview with the those of you who live in the bay area who have visited the bay area know that off 280 there's a building a, a residence commonly known as the flintstone house Okay. which has all I rounded the Barbara Papa house. But... <laughs> right, I think of it as like the Planet of the Apes house because it reminds me of the village from the first Planet of the Apes movie. <laughs> um, but it's known popularly as the Flintstone house. And uh, as a result, the current owners actually put giant dinosaurs in the backyard. But that was be that awesome. as it may, which is awesome. Um, and uh, anyway, the, uh, the, the, I read an interview with the architect and he deliberately designed it round because he felt that the human dwellings uh, that were square rectangular did not reflect our evolutionary origins and made us unhappy in a way that roundness makes us and, and so roundness makes us happy psychologically because we grew up in caves and trees and things that were not in nature square. He had this whole theory about that and this house was an implementation of his theory quite deliberate. <clears throat> now, I don't know that I buy into it, but it's interesting. It was it was a, made, meant to be an example of that. And he wanted to do a whole revolution, but it was such an unpopular design that he gave up and went and did other things with his life. Well, I, I mean, we used to have some of this in the late 60s, early 70s. And I don't recall them being particularly preferable to anything else, really. <clears throat> and that's kind of why it died. I like uh, uh, maybe I'm just a closet capitalist, but I'm thinking that if those had some sort of intrinsic value of over and above square things, they would still be um, something people are looking for. And and I'm trying to think about architectural styles. Like the last time we really had curved stuff was kind of about that same era like modernism showed up and and yeah i don't know well there was a fad for like uh very fancy yurts in the 1990s 
if people are getting for like second homes or, or even first homes. But like, yeah. I'm thinking that, that I the fact that we cut lumber into rectangles is going to influence the fact that we're building rectangular buildings. Well, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. They're easier and cheaper make to build. Curved, you have to actually work at it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, the thing is that the trees tend to be cylindrical, so you have to work at making them not cylindrical. If the only yeah, thing you do, you have a whole infrastructure to do that. <laughs> right. Yeah, but why? Well, and also just because, I mean, okay, even if trees are round in raw form, they're not particularly workable that way. It's really hard to well, steam I mean, an entire trunk. Cabins, right? Because they're, cause yeah. like, even though the tree itself is round, the length of it is pretty much a straight line. Yeah. Right? And you're, and a, for a log cabin, you're basically stacking trees in four directions, mm-hmm. right? Well, and and that goes back to Morgan's point was, or I think it's Morgan's point that yes. And if you look at the amount of lumber used in a log cabin, it's like 12 times what you would use in a house that is not primarily made of the lumber, but mostly made of sheetrock and insulation. Yeah. So yeah, I sure. Yeah. But what, uh, from a world building point of view, Mm -hmm. um, with what we're seeing now is the dawn of an age where it is possible to 3D print a house. True. People are doing it. So once you can 3D print a rectangular house, you can 3D print any kind of thing that will def- that will not defy gravity, right? If 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 it's not going to collapse, then it can be it can be printed. So you can do round, you can do conical, you can do pyramid shapes you know whatever combination of all of the above if you have the architecture i think i I mean i think that humans well you know it's interesting have you ever looked out of a window down onto an agricultural area yes seen like squares squares are nice because they 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 tessellate (laughs) right Uh i've seen i've seen circular um fields because like of a you know where they irrigate around a central point and they have a rotating irrigation system yep. mm-hmm. that does seen more and more of that. a great deal of, of of empty space in between so maybe that's mm-hmm. why it doesn't happen quite as often yeah the it, the, the the tessellation um of of shape um is going to um That waste space. What is it? Is it waste space or is it space for something that doesn't belong inside the basic shape? Right. I mean, you could argue that, like, if you used round for housing units, for example, that then that would leave some nice space for these for these um, plumbing and whatever. <laughs> yep. And that's how a lot of space habitats and, and you know, Rama was, de- you know, was developed was that, you know, rockets are tubes. <laughs> and since we already have that material up there, might as well use it for something. And really, if we're trying to enclose the greatest amount of space for the least amount of material, that's where we get domes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sure. Uh, you know, yeah, Buckminster Fuller was big problem. on that. Hmm? In fiction, science fiction, anyway. Yep. I mean, I I still haven't found the people who are building like igloos out of out of out of sand bricks or mud bricks. And I think that would be great. Ooh. Yeah. I, I wonder what the thermal properties of that would be, right? Uh, it would be roughly Adobe, I would think. So why so why are Adobe nice buildings? Why are Adobe structures? Tend to, why do they tend to be in um, rectangular flat roofs and um, squares versus in, um, an, an igloo, which, as I understand it, tends to be a, a dome or a half, half dome? I know that they actually are. Um, I think prior to the Spaniards getting here, they were mostly built in cliff environments. And so they were just trying to enclose as much safe space as you could on a fairly 
you know, dangerous precipice. So that's kind of how that happened. Um, and I think probably you end up with straight walls interiorizing that because they're the cheapest, easiest thing to build. Um, building a curved wall is, it, that takes some calculus. Although if you, if you do it right, um, one of the reasons that England has um, curved walls um, that are made of brick Mm -hmm. is because if you put up a, a straight wall of one course of brick, you can just toss it over. Knock it's, it it's, over. It, yeah. But if you do yeah. one course of wavy brick, it'll hold itself up. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, there's there's lots of stuff. And and I think one of the things that, that again, I you know, very Douglas Adams, I'm worried about the I amount of things other people don't know. <laughs> Um, because a lot of this stuff has been done and we don't have to reinvent the wheel. You just have to go find wherever it was mm -hmm. that the last person set it down. Right. So uh, I want to uh, bring in something uh, that we sort of touched on about architecture, which is uh, when I was in graduate school, I read a whole bunch of ethnographies on the Middle East. And one of them had a section focused on traditional versus modern architecture mm. in Middle Eastern societies, which are highly gendered, gender divided. And it pointed out that in the traditional architecture, which was being made less and less often because it was more expensive to make it that way. And also because the French colonizers had imposed French style houses. Mm. Um, there were the, these houses that were basically cloister shaped. So they were, they were square donuts and in the middle was a big area where the women lived and had trees and stuff because they didn't go out of the house mm -hmm. almost ever. And, um, but the modern houses that uh, were being imposed on these societies are, um, don't have that enclosure that is open. So, which means they're stuck indoors. It's yeah. a big difference. Um, made a big difference to the women. So naturally it didn't matter to the architects or anything. Um, and then the other- The male architects. Right, right, right yes. The other, um, the male colonial masters. The other thing was that uh, in certain poor districts, if you couldn't afford that kind of a house, you would have several apartment comp uh, buildings and there would be like a courtyard where the women from like mm -hmm. five or six different households would congregate with the small kids and all of that outdoors again that was a very functional kind of architecture that didn't reveal the physiology of the humans that built it any more than any other human architecture but it but it it revealed the society mm -hmm. right <clears throat> yeah um just the way that a castles reveals the tech level of the society because of the defenses right you know whether it's designed to to go against catapults or cannon for instance yep. Right. Um, right. And, and so that's, that's something to consider as well, uh, is, is how it, how, if you're, if you're world building, which this, you know, we're talking about, you know, what kind of society, what are the roles of different people in the society and what social classes and gender roles and other divisions of society and how the architecture reflects yeah. and either works in harmonious ways with it or against it, right? And so I, I think we've it's talked, worth we've talking talked about, about average height too. There's a hilarious uh, photo blog of a really tall person in Japan. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes, there are quite a number. I mean, the thing about it is that, um, it's 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 revelatory of a couple of things actually it's 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 going to show you the average height of a certain type of person that the society is designed for mm -hmm. um right um not necessarily everyone generally adult men but here's um, the thing in our <laughs> in our society yes but here's the thing We've, we're talking, we've been talking about practicalities and efficiency and uh, speed and ease. Um, we've entirely left out aesthetics. And when you look at 
ceiling heights. Mm -hmm. Is the ceiling height, is, is that rel relevant to the location? Because in some time, sometimes the ceilings are higher because you want the place to be cooler and the heat will rise. Mm -hmm. but, what, so, but at a certain point, ceiling height is not going to say anything about the height of the people who live there. But door height. It could be a marker. But door height might not wall. either. It just depends. In, 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 some, in some buildings, and it's usually aesthetics or display of wealth, you can look at the doors and say, these doors are meant to accommodate people who are eight feet tall, but there's nobody eight feet tall here. Mm -hmm. This wasn't built for someone <clears throat> like that. Mm -hmm. It was built to show that we could afford to build up a, a building or because we thought or, it looked better with the rest you know, of the house. If you look at cathedrals. That's exactly mm -hmm. where I was going with Chart, yes. which is huge and has huge doors and high ceilings, the whole thing. And the stairways are teeny. <laughs> I was going to suggest, in general, liturgical architecture, yep. which is often wildly impractical and wildly. gorgeous and designed to, pro to invoke a sense of the numinous in the viewer, no matter the religion. This is not just cathedrals, it's synagogues, mosques, ashrams, all sorts of, mm -hmm. even pyramids are, in a sense, liturgical architecture. Well, unless they're landing pads, but we don't need to go into that right now. Well, you can, you know, depends on your religion, whether it's E.T. or, you know, the pharaohs <laughs> from outer space. Or, you know. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, there's, there's all of that coming together. And I don't, I'm trying to think of an author who's really done like a huge amount of justice that everybody recognizes to the architecture of their worlds. And I'm not coming up with anybody that, you know, you say that and a whole group of people would be like, oh yes, that is important. I mean, possibly uh, like Gene Wolf did a good job, but he's not, you know, Foucault. Mervyn Peake, Gorman guest. Never read it. Good choice. Yeah, it's all <laughs> okay. about it's all about the architecture. Okay. Uh huh. Okay. Sounds cool. <laughs> um, the novel what's his face tried really hard. Ken Mieville is very good at describing his world, but what he does with it is not to my taste. Um, I won't give away the twist, but the city in the city is also all, a lot about yep. the architecture and space. Yep. It is all about the two cities and mm -hmm. what Who's they got look access like to and, what and, spaces and yep. where it is and all that good stuff. That's, which is different from like his, you know, Perdido Street Station and other stuff like that, where he described buildings. But that mm -hmm. book in, in particular, now that I think about it, the city in the city is specifically all uh, 300 pages of architecture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I keep wondering, I, I, I keep thinking back to like the, a discussion that I once read about why clocks go around the way they go around. And the answer is that at the beginning, some clocks went one way and some clocks went the other way. And then finally, just basically everybody decided that one way was was better and and it wasn't actually better. It was just more popular because of other reasons that you know, might have to do with the purveyor of the clocks, but basically now clockwise is just one thing. Not in Israel. Well, so point being that like, you know, you get eight track tapes and you get cassette tapes and then, and then there is actually eight track tapes were actually, I think, you know, from what I've heard, you know, technologically superior, but because of just surrounding circumstances, cassette tapes were the ones that took off and then became the standard, right? Which does uh, not exist problems. or that people do not use them. They did, uh, but it's like VHS versus beta. Yeah. yeah. Eight tracks had the limitation, had some limitations. And also the noise was worse on the tape quality because uh -huh. it's eight track instead of two track. But uh, eight tracks, all four all four channels had to be the same length so songs were cut in the middle 
to accommodate albums. The order of songs is rearranged to better accommodate, so fewer songs were cut in the middle. So uh, this that, is not a problem with change. the set. So that change or that standardization is based on, uh, at least in part, on the actual function of each of the, the, the things. If you're talking about clockwise versus counterclockwise, and it's if the the machines are the same, it's just that the hands go around in different directions, then somebody just chose one or some buddies chose one, however that happened. And that's a matter of, it should be possible to say, you know, it's, it's two o'clock and have the person standing next to you who's not looking at the same clock know what you're talking about, that you should mm -hmm. be able to read any <laughs> clock and have it say the same thing. It's a standardization based on a need for standardization, not on a technological superiority of one direction versus the other. Um, it's linguistic because the reason clocks tend to run the other way in Israel is the Hebrew's written right to left, whereas mm -hmm. yeah, but but it'd be all the same way, left to right. Um, it could, but if you're reading a clock in the direction you're used to reading, from the top of a page to the left to the bottom of the page to the right, you'll tend to read it clockwise rather than counterclockwise. Well, I don't know. I well, whatever. I mean. I, Clocks in Japan are still going clockwise, even though you read top to bottom, right to left in traditional Japanese writing. So I'm not sure that those two things are linked, but they might be. Um, it might just be that we're contrary people. Well, and it's also the time. Well, could be both. The time and the um, technologic level when clocks were introduced also matters because I think at that point we, 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 were, we had writing, so we had people doing writing and about 80 to 90% of the population is right-handed. Mm. So when you look at people who are doing the craftsmanship, um, which direction are they more likely to pick? The one that is more likely to correspond with their handedness, I think, might also be a contributing factor. I find mm, it really interesting on a, on, a, on, a, on a global level that the chirality that allows human life to exist is a right-handed chirality mm. as well. Well, so I'm also going to say it's probably also going to have something to do with the kind of writing implements that you're using. Oh, yeah. Yes. Because, like, if you're writing in cuneiform, <laughs> uh, yeah, it doesn't really matter. Then, as much, yeah, right. Um, That's kind of cool. <laughs> so, so, you know, I, so you're different. saying that it's some clocks different. are more sinister than others. Oh, God. I'm gonna someday. I'm gonna put you, Stant Latore, and uh, James Nickel in a room, and probably we will create a singularity, the power of which has never been seen before. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Well, you get that many leftists in a room, you know. <laughs> well, yeah, it's interesting because, like, let's 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 talk for a second about handedness because. Mm -hmm. A lot of things are designed for for handedness. Most and things. A lot of things are designed for right handedness. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, we own because cool I'm right handed, and my Everything. sons are right handed, but my my husband is left handed. <laughs> he went to the left handed. Is that because he's from Australia? Scissors oh. and like a couple of, and a pen and a couple of other things. Um, but what's interesting is you know that it's hard to imagine how how our how our preferences i'll call it a preference it's a little bit more physiological than that but our preferences influence the form of our inventions right mm -hmm. i don't know i just think it's really interesting because like writing right-handed mm -hmm. left to right on a piece of paper well, and 
what happens when we break out of that too? I'm thinking about ski equipment. When oh. we started skiing, they had one end that was the rounded end and the other end that was the flat end. And the one that was the rounded end was forward. And the same thing with snowboards. Mm. And so we snowboarded much like we skied. And there was goofy foot and, and, and regular foot, depending on which foot you had forward. And it corresponds with your handedness for the most part. And then we found out that we can do so much more fun stuff if we make both ends rounded and slightly raised. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so now skis individually are um, what mirror images of each other. Uh, you know what I mean? Symmetrical. Yeah. Thank you. There's, there's each ski is symmetrical to itself rather than the other, and snowboards are also the same way. Like you, you're they're meant to be ridden in both directions, mm -hmm. and so uh, yeah, it just uh, it makes me wonder if we stop doing that with a whole bunch of other stuff, whether we'll like it better as well. What are you showing us here, Cliff? Uh, two different mug, coffee mugs mug. from my extensive collection. This is a Hawkwind mug that has the handle on one side and an Octavia Butler mug that has ah. the handle on the other. Although this does have the uh, yeah. sponsor on one side, but they're, but they're like designed for like, if you want to show them off to your friends on Zoom, they're handed <laughs> this way. If you want to enjoy the artwork, they're handed this way. Uh huh. And that, that is a whole nother thing is the aesthetics of objects. Are they meant for the consumer? Or they yes. meant for the, the audience that the consumer of, of the person who bought it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and, and we've gone into we haven't even gone into like physiological shapes and why they happen. Yeah, I wanted to bring up um, I think it was Gateway at that point of because they knew what the the pilots couches on the spacecraft look like and they were not anything that would make that would be comfortable for a human <laughs> and there's a lot of that yeah yes yeah. i loved that the hechi they they kept speculating about the shape of hechi butts but then yes. it turned out they had these they had these spread legs and these pouches underneath that they then uh -huh. sat on so yep. they 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 inferred something incorrect about their physiology mm -hmm. but there was something about the physiology that explained hechi chairs and i just love that when we got to like book mm -hmm. three or whatever and he, and he explained that yes hechi butts were a subject <laughs> yep and i think one of the mars books did that too and i don't remember which one it was and i don't want it to be ben bova uh, but yeah i sorry <laughs> But yeah, there's, there's, they, they do all of this ideating, ideating about what the creatures looked like by how high the elevator buttons were off the floor and what color, um, what color does it turn when you did it right? You know, what light spectrum are these, are these beings seeing as normal? Mm -hmm. And what kind of illumination? What mm -hmm. color is it? How bright is it? You know, so yeah, there's there's all sorts of stuff. And there's also, you know, like we think of height as being the si the height of our bodies like from end to end. Well, that would mean a door for a Diplodocus, the way that we would think about it would be 700 feet tall. Did it need that? No, because it's parallel to the ground. <laughs> right. But do we say Diplodocus is, is, we look at a Diplodocus, we measure it, you know, same way, well, imagine you should measure it, same way you'd measure a horse, you know. No, yep, we but don't. We don't. No, we um, measure horses in a way that we measure nothing else. <laughs> Literally, because we measure them in hands. There, okay, uh, yeah. but, like, reading, but in terms um, of the direction. Yeah, you know, no, we, th yep. I don't know, has anyone read a fire the ground. Ground. <laughs> Not, don't think so. Uh, Fire Upon the Deep by Werner Vinge. I'm reading the sequel finally after many years, Children of the Sky, uh -huh. where so the Fire Upon the Deep, everything is, all the architecture is different because of the species of uh -huh. Tyne's world. There are these pack animals where like anywhere four to six pack animals are a person and they communicate among themselves using ultrasonics. So they can't get too near anyone else. And also they're dog-like. And so their architecture is because they can't get too near to too, too near other people. 
Mm -hmm. um, and they're dog-like. The ceilings are very low and the streets are very wide. And walkways are very wide. So the two, two, and they have these little turnoffs. So the two packs can pass each other without getting literally confused. Um, and so there's a whole lot. And then there's one pack describing a human and he, he says, oh, they're so high at the shoulder. Right, so they uh -huh. described humans as like how high we were at the shoulder, um, which was kind of hilarious. But another another sensor sensory thing is on Red Dwarf. You may remember the the character Cat in one of the first season episodes is reading a book developed by the sentient cat species that he belongs to, and it's all smells. He's yeah, smelling the book in terms of page, and, you know, that tells the story. Yeah, and somewhere in time, there is a huge, long treatise about why paper is continues to be the shape it is, and why all of the Battlestar Galactica corner cutoff things are incredibly stupid, and no one should use them, and yada yada. And I was like, well, apparently this was important enough to you that you had to comment at length, but okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> I remember that they, I, I saw an interview with the designer for Battlestar Galactica and they said that, well, for the pilot, they just did it for the one set of books because they thought it looked cool. And then they were like, oh, we have to do this for uh -huh. every season now. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yep. That's so they regretted that decision. Oh, yeah. Well, that's the set designers. Do not do things on whims. Don't. <laughs> I thought it looked cool, but you know, it was a big no, I, pain in the toughest for that. It did, but yes, I can see why it would be and why you would not want to do I mean, because even making the form to make the paper is extra miter sawing, and who needs that? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and, and I, I think it's something that we should think about when we're world building like this. It's like, what extra stuff do we have to invent in order to make this happen and how much extra time is it going to take and is there a reason for it rather than just hand waving it you know can we make the the immense amount of time it takes to make this thing part of the sacrifice to the higher power um in in the process of making it like that's part of the blessing is that they had to put in this extra time and do these extra steps and do all this stuff. Because clearly we have, I mean, who thought of nixtamalization of corn, for God's sake? You know, I, there's, there's all these things that we have, these weird and protracted uh, production, like times and, and, and <laughs> thank you, um, <laughs> that you need a flow chart, like, you know, to make something edible. And yet we do it. Well, I think it, the thing to some degree, there's, there's a factor of, well, it started out simple and then, and then we realized that we needed to do this other thing or something changed or, you know, or we were starving. <laughs> so we were like, what can I do to make this edible? <laughs> you know, um, mm -hmm. and, that, and that is actually something worth spending a great deal of effort on is keeping yourself from starving <laughs> so, <laughs> or being poisoned. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I I was just going back very quickly to the um, churches and things. There's a lot of specific. Ones. What's interesting in church architecture is the theology incorporated in the architecture. Like windows tend to be like in Gothic cathedrals tend to be in threes because of Trinity. It's a, a physical manifestation of a theological tenant mm -hmm. and um stuff like that and then there's the practical like if you have a large population who can't read a bunch of stained glass windows telling bible stories is really practical because <laughs> the only way they're going to get that story that's true right mm -hmm. that's true. especially if the service is in latin and none of them understand latin and then there's mm -hmm. like there was physical physical differences that reflect the class structure like i visited pompeii um, and it was taken over by Romans. But so the original poorest houses were subdivided to be smaller and the original biggest houses, they knocked down half of them so they could build bigger houses. So the wealth gap reflected in the final architecture of Pompeii 
was radically different than the, how the city was originally built, which mm. was much, much less of a gap between the richest and poorest citizens of Pompeii. So that was kind of interesting, right? Yeah, and one of the things that I've been been working with with the current thing that I'm working on is um, in in Varan, all the structures are are old unless you've knocked something down and rebuilt it. And particularly in the city of Darrenville, which is entirely excavated, there isn't a lot of change that you can really make to the structure of Darrenville. You can expand it. <laughs> and in fact, it expands every year because <laughs> people keep digging <laughs> in the stone. But like, but um, but there there are limitations. And so, in fact, if you have an old structure, there's not a lot you can do to change it. Mm -hmm. So I was like, you know, if there are people living in this area, what was the area used for before? Why is the structure the way it is? And what does that mean for things like, you know, the plumbing <laughs> mm -hmm. and ventilation and everything else? Um, but yeah, so, and it, you know, depending on what, what kind of media you're working with, what kind of materials you're working with, um, you know, you get a lot of variation that way. And you also get uh, a lot, the history has a lot to do with mm -hmm. um, the way that the things are right now and and it can hide in the smallest little objects yeah you know? mm -hmm. so yeah i was just imagining like people trying to sort of both live in and excavate something off world and trying to string electric lines for things and having someone who is not involved in that work being going you know how come this isn't done and how come we haven't done this already and the other person going did you bring a trained ferret no <laughs> Then I don't care how long it takes. We're getting it done. <laughs> and and that that sort of why isn't it done yet thing is is I mean that is just transported from Earth. Yes. Where it it it's that's not fiction. <laughs> that's not fiction at all. I'm saying I'm being too realistic. <laughs> uh, that's one of the things that drives me uh, nuts about about bad guys is 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 no matter how smart the bad guy is otherwise, there will come a point when they tell their victim, you must do thus and such impossible thing in this and such impossible time frame, or I will shoot you. And the person doesn't because it's not actually possible, no matter how threatened you are mm -hmm. um, or how comfortable you are. And they shoot the person and then they have the next person and the next person is just going, I, I, I still can't do it. It's, you know, what is your, what is that? It drives me nuts, but that's, I, so I don't know why villains are that, shit, but that's a whole nother thing. That is not where I thought you were going with this. I, I thought <laughs> we're doing so much architecture. You're going to talk about volcano layers <laughs> of villains. Like, I know it's an active volcano. Let's build a base there. <laughs> oh no! I don't even want to. No, I mean that that yeah, no. It, it, it's that whole sideline thing there. Um, yeah. So no, that's that's not new. The the uh, why isn't it done? I have no idea what it is you're doing, but I'm going to complain because it's not done to my satisfaction. Yeah, that's not new. Um, that's not fiction. <laughs> another another example. Great ferrets, though. I like that. Wonderful. Aliens. I, I highly recommend a, for world building, a, a Fire Upon the Deep by Werner Vinge is just fabulous. He's got a lot of worlds, a lot of aliens. Um, there's a, a, the main ship used in the, in the novel is called the Out of Band 2. And the controls are designed for sentient plants with multiple fronds that they can move. So it's very hard for a human to operate the ship because we don't have enough free limbs mm -hmm. to do it. I want to go back to the ferrets. <laughs> Well, it's, got nothing, it's got nothing to do with the shape of the things, <laughs> but, but if, you're, if this is a new world and you're saying you didn't bring a trained ferret, then how do you go about 
solving that problem. If you need what's basically a trained ferret, do you, is there something in your environment that you can use as a trained ferret? Is, are there local, is there local wildlife that you could maybe domesticate, which is a whole other post. Mm -hmm. Genetically, yeah, um, I think those are great questions. Local cephalopod. No, but I think I think those are great questions, and that would that would be how you would figure that out. I mean, obviously, yes, we did this kind of wiring before we thought of training ferrets, but we didn't do a whole lot of it. And I, as far as I know, it took um, a lot of text, a lot of time, and um, lots of blue language was used, and larger than <laughs> larger holes than necessary were made in the preceding structure in order to fit human tools and limbs through it so yeah that's a that that's a, absolutely a thing and also you know cat five used to weigh a lot more than it does now mm. um so you know you couldn't have uh, if you were doing this in telephone wire you would have needed to use uh, trained monkeys and at that point you know you might as well just use kids um mm. so uh, yeah kind of you know you you're running into that that or you know trained cockroaches <laughs> <laughs> no uh, no. You know, hissing cockroaches can be trained to a certain degree, so I'm I'm okay with it. <laughs> on fiber optics. Well, I wouldn't want them in my ship. I wouldn't want them in my ship. No, no, me neither. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so since it's past five and, uh, and we've had a very lively discussion, I'm going to thank you all for being here and. Uh, and we will reconvene. I am not sure if I'm going to be up for uh -huh. a show next Tuesday. <laughs> understood. Uh, yeah, very much understood. Gee, so I why? Think we should probably resume the following week. <laughs> I was like thinking about not having yeah. a show today. And I was like, wait a minute. No, because <laughs> next week will be a million times worse. <laughs> anyway, um, but thank you. I really enjoyed this discussion, and um, we will we will resume in two weeks. Um, and uh, I love you all. Thank you to everyone who watches the video.